got your notebook. Welcome to CN Live, Season 3, Episode 8, Palestine, 20 Years Later. I'm Joe Lauria, the Editor-in-Chief of Consortium News. On today's show, acclaimed journalist and filmmaker John Pilger discusses the changes that have come over Palestine in the past 20 years since the making of his film, Palestine is Still the Issue, released first in 1974 and updated in 2002. The past two decades have seen an extreme turn to the right in Israeli politics with grave consequences for Palestine and its quest for independence, including four major Israeli attacks against Gaza. Since John's film, Israel also walled in the Palestinians on the West Bank. The Oslo Accords definitively failed. The Second Intifada ended with thousands killed. Yes, Arafat died and Benjamin Netanyahu's 12 year reign moved Israel even further to the right. We'll begin tonight's show with a full screening of John Pilger's 52 minute classic documentary, followed by a discussion with Pilger and Israeli historian, Elan Pape, who appeared in the 2002 film. They will discuss the worsening situation over the decades for Palestinians and where the future of Palestine and Israel is headed. Pape is the author of many books, including The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, in which he documents that indeed ethnic cleansing was a long-standing Zionist goal that was planned in detail by David Ben-Gurion in the Red House headquarters outside Tel Aviv and included a much greater number of atrocities against Palestinians in the establishment of Israel in the late 1940s than is generally recognized. Pape says it was the start of a process of ethnic cleansing that continues until today unbroken from those earliest days. About that book, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, Publishers Weekly wrote, denied for almost six decades. Had it happened today, it could only have been called ethnic cleansing. Decisively debunking the myth that the Palestinian population left of their own accord in the course of this war, Elan Pape offers impressive archival evidence to demonstrate that from its very inception, a central plank in Israel's founding ideology was the forcible removal of the indigenous population. The book Publishers Weekly says is indispensable for anyone interested in the current crisis in the Middle East. And now the film Palestine is Still the Issue by John Pilger. There is only one way of ending this. It's ending occupation because occupation has become the cancer that is eating the lives of both people. What the occupation did for us, it reduced us into animals in a way that sometimes I'm ashamed to say that I'm in Israel. This is, you know, a huge uh, uh, bluff of, 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 you know, of the Israeli establishment, that every, you know, criticism of its policy is anti-Semitism. Sometimes I feel uh, pity for the Israeli mothers, because they are thinking that their the soldiers or their sons are victorious soldiers, but they should come and see what their soldiers are doing here. Twenty-five years ago, I made a film called Palestine is Still the Issue. It was about a nation of people, the Palestinians, forced off their land and later subjected to a military occupation by Israel, an occupation condemned by the United Nations and almost every country in the world, including Britain. But Israel is backed by a very powerful friend, the United States. So in 25 years, if we're to speak of the great injustice here, nothing has changed. What has changed is that the Palestinians have fought back. Stateless and humiliated for so long, they've risen up against Israel's huge military machine, although they themselves have no army, 
no tanks, no American planes and gunships or missiles. Some have committed desperate acts of terror, like suicide bombing. But for Palestinians, the overriding routine terror, day after day, has been the ruthless control of almost every aspect of their lives, as if they live in an open prison. This film is about the Palestinians and a group of courageous Israelis united in the oldest human struggle to be free. Last April, troops and tanks of the Israeli army attacked Ramallah and other towns in occupied Palestine. This was reported as an incursion to stop terrorism. In fact, it was also an attack on civilian life, on schools, offices, clinics, theatres, radio stations. This systematic vandalism is typical of one of the longest military occupations in modern times. Even the culture ministry was destroyed. The director, Liana Badri, a distinguished novelist and filmmaker, showed me the devastation shortly after it had happened. This is the administration room. We had a lot of files here. Yeah. You can see that everything were broken. It was the best place in yeah. the ministry. I mean, what you did here was promote projects for Palestinian culture basically, filmmaking, projects for children. Uh, exhibitions, uh, book exhibitions, uh, painters exhibitions, uh, uh, festivals, uh, dance, uh, folklore. Uh, we had a lot of so projects. So now we don't have anything to begin. We don't have computers, equipment, furniture. And we have this feeling of humiliation. The smell is awful, isn't it? This. Is awful, yes. this is a this is a bag of shit, and there's shit smeared all over the photocopier. Two, two. two uh, so they just ate and and, bags and defecated of shit, yes. in the same place. Yes, and uh, putting them on the photocopy, putting the shit everywhere, even on the walls. And you can see that we have toilet, two toilets in every floor, but they didn't use the toilet all the time. They were making it on the floor or anywhere, as you can see. We have yes. a look in this room in here. Good grief. Look at this. These are children's drawings, aren't they? Yes. This is the room specialized for children's work children's uh, uh, paintings and children's culture and to encourage yeah. them to paint, to let them express themselves, to make competition, uh, uh, writing competitions. Uh, but you can see how they destroyed everything. They don't respect anything. They just want to come and destroy. And this is the systematic terrorism of the Israeli state. For the Palestinians, this cultural vandalism means a deliberate intention to destroy them as a nation. The heart of the conflict here is a struggle for land, for the hills and valleys of Palestine, for precious water and fertile soil. During the early 20th century, the great majority of the population of Palestine were Palestinian Arabs. In 1948, Israel was founded in the shadow of the Holocaust. For the Palestinians, this meant the loss of 78% of their country. Today, they are seeking only the remaining 22% of their homeland. For 35 years, that homeland has been dominated by Israel. In 1987, the Palestinians rose up in what they call Intifada. History will surely call it a war of national liberation. 
They fought mainly with slingshots against tanks and planes, and they were put down with this kind of brutality. Israeli soldiers deliberately breaking the bones of prisoners. Some of the soldiers later insisted they were carrying out official Israeli policy. Two years ago, the Palestinians rose up a second time. This was hardly surprising. During curfews, people live under a form of house arrest. Without notice, they can be locked inside their homes. Their ordinary lives are a maze of controls, roadblocks, checkpoints. This is how I remembered apartheid South Africa. The hidden effect is the same, humiliation and anger and death. This Palestinian woman knows how devastating the impact of checkpoints can be. Last October, she was about to give birth to her second child, and she and her husband set out for the nearby hospital. They were stopped at an Israeli roadblock where they pleaded to be let through. <laughs> فهي قطعت حبل السرة في شفرة ووعي الولد يعني ضل يوعي الولد فعود لفة بجاكيتة ولفينا عن طريق كريمزان من اتصل في سيارة من كرايبة شوفير عودنا طلعنا لما وصلنا المستشفى الفرنسي ولا هو الولد متوفي Stories like Fatima's seldom make headlines, and yet many similar cases have been documented. Palestinians try to lead a normal life, but life is never normal. During Israeli military operations, curfews stop everything. Ambulances are denied access to the sick and wounded. Children are stopped from going to school. The Israelis claim this is necessary for their security. If that's true, it's clearly not working. And the security of Palestinians is almost never mentioned. You feel all your life that you are humiliated. You don't control yourself. You don't control the air you are breathing. You don't. I don't want, I don't want to talk about planning for anything. This is something we don't even dream about. Plan to next hour or next day what we will do. This is something we don't even dream about because our destiny is not in our hands. It's, it's in the hands of the others who decide how we will live how we will get married, to get married, to come and live with my husband in this country, I had to take the permission of the Israelis. It's not enough that they took our land and they are not allowing us to have our own state, but also they are controlling every detail in our life. Some Israelis have spoken out. More than 500 soldiers have refused to serve in the occupied territories. We are, they've said, like the Chinese student who stood in front of the tank in Tiananmen Square, we are the conscience of our country. Ishai Rosensvi is one of them. 
I really think the real story of the occupation is there in the checkpoints. I cannot forget this kind of picture, you know, five in the morning, quarter to five in the morning, hundreds of a line of hundreds of people waiting, you know, to pass in the in the checkpoint, and you're standing there, and you see their eyes, some the the, the humiliation, the frustration, the hatred. Them, you are the occupation. You have all the power. They have no power. You can at every second take their ID and then they are, you know, they have nothing because without ID identification you can, you know, every soldier can, can arrest them. You are the man that stand there, keep them without rights, without freedom. The world often sees the issue of Palestine through the tragedy and horror of suicide bombings, an expression of despair by powerless people against an oppressor armed with modern weapons. The first female suicide bomber struck in January 2002. Her name was Wafa Idris, the only daughter of a family of refugees who were driven out of their home near Tel Aviv. She was 28, an ambulance volunteer. What makes an ambulance volunteer, a carer, become a suicide bomber? تحكي لنا انه اليوم في واحد استشهد طبعا نزل مخه على الارض مصاريره كانوا طالعات اجره كانت طالعه من محلها طبعا هاي نوع اثر عليها بعض الحالات حتى اللي بيكون يعني بعض الفتيات بتكون حوامل بدها تولد طبعا تولد على الحاجز يموت الطفل تبعها على الحاجز صوبت ثلاث مرات في رصاص المطاط يعني هذا انا بتوقع انه هذا يكون the suicide bombs are presented to the Israeli public as an insane act by an insane people uh, uh, with, with whom there is no chance for peace. Instead of putting a wider analysis which would say there is a, a way out of the suicide bombs, while everybody con condemns them, and rightly so, there is a way out of it. And the way out of it is to provide the circumstances in which uh, these young people would find uh, avenues of hope instead of avenues of despair. There is, I would say, an orchestrated campaign to silence that kind of uh, analysis inside Israel. Suicide attacks against civilians are clearly crimes, and they are used by extremists. But the extremists rely on the brutality of the occupation and the despair of their young volunteers. Some extraordinary Israelis are brave enough to recognize this. Rami El Hanan is one Israeli father who knows about suicide bombing. On September the 4th, 1997, his daughter Shmada was killed by one. She was 14 years old. <laughs> she was a child of peace. She was full of life, very laughing girl, very good student, dancing, everything that little girls do. It was the first day of school and she was going down the Ben Yehuda Street, which is a, some kind of a mall, uh, to buy some books for the new year with two girlfriends of hers. One of them, Sivan Zaga, died with her, and the other, Daniela Beman, was very, very severely wounded. Rami is a graphic designer and a former soldier. His father survived Auschwitz. His grandparents, six aunts and uncles, 
perished in the Holocaust. How, how do you distinguish the feelings of anger that any father would have felt at losing your daughter in such circumstances? I'm not crazy. I don't forget. I don't forgive. Someone who murders little girls, anyone who murders little girls, is a criminal and should be punished. But if you think from the head and not from the guts, and you look what made people do what they do, people that don't have hope, people who are desperate enough to commit suicide, you have to ask yourself, have you contributed in any way for this despair? For this craziness, it, it hasn't come out of the blue. The boy that his mother was humiliated in the morning at the checkpoint will commit suicide in the evening. The suicide bomber was a victim the same as my girl was, of that I'm sure. You have to understand where these suicide bombers come from. Understanding is part of the way to solving the problem. Few people have been betrayed so often as the Palestinians. Before the Second World War, the British ran Palestine as a mandate. They had promised the Palestinians an independent state, but they also promised Palestine to the Jewish movement known as Zionism. In 1948, when the State of Israel was founded, the Arab world revolted as Palestinians were expelled from their homes or forced to flee in a blitz of fear and terror. Three quarters of a million people became refugees. Israel's military hero, General Moshe Dayan, later admitted, Jewish places were built in the place of Arab villages. There is not one single place in the country that did not have a former Arab population. While Palestinians were denied the right to return to their homes, anybody who could prove they were Jewish had the right to settle in Israel. In 1967, Palestinians once again fled their homes during the Six-Day War when Israel occupied the remaining 22% of Palestine, describing this as an act of self-defense. To the Palestinians, it seems that Israel's colonizing never stops. This looks like a medieval fortress. The Israelis call it a Jewish settlement. In fact, it's part of a network of armed colonies that by one estimate, effectively control 42% of the occupied West Bank. Many of them dominate and intimidate Palestinian communities. They are illegal under international law and have been condemned by the United Nations. When I came to West Bank and saw all these settlements, Israeli settlements, on the tops of the hills, you know, surrounding all the cities, so you feel that they are over you, they are superior. Mm. And you are the, the ant, the, the insect, down, you know? And you know this is your land, it's nobody's else land, this is our land. But still, they are the ones who are on the tops, and they have all the weapons, uh, and they, they control also everything in the West Bank. This is Moshe Dan. He's taking me to a Jewish settlement in the south of the country, in Palestinian Gaza. Shalom. Shalom. Me. I see here, this is all electrified fence along mm -hmm. here, isn't it? By electrified barbed wire. I mean, this is a, a, almost a constant state of war, isn't it, really? I mean, if you have to put up something like electrified it is today. barbed wire. It is today. The barbed wire is new because of the situation where Jews are driving home on the road, and some guy who is a Pal supposed to be a Palestinian policeman shoots the car up. The Israelis bring with them a version of apartheid. 
we pass this road being built for the sole use of Jewish settlers and soldiers until it's opened. These Palestinians must wait hours for the few settlers to drive by. Isn't that strike you as remarkable that there is a, a road for only one ethnic group of people, a Jews only road? It wasn't always like that. But it Jews, is now. That's... It is now. The reason because many uh, uh, about a year and a half ago, a school bus, a bus was blown up, an Israeli school bus, as it was traveling from Kfar Darum by um, Arab terrorists. So we decided that the best thing to do would be to create some kind of separation. There doesn't seem to be any doubt that the majority of people deeply resent the presence of this settlement. <sighs> the, oh, Look, I don't know what the, the actual people, Arabs who live here, feel and think. Uh, on a political level, they, I'm sure, would prefer not to be under Israeli rule. But in terms of raising their families and supporting their families, this is, I think, one of the best solutions for them. For 35 years, the United Nations has voted on this best solution. Almost unanimously, it has called on Israel to respect international law and get out of occupied Palestine. Inside the settlers' fortress is a surreal middle-class suburb dropped into one of the most overcrowded and porous corners of the world. One of the strategic aims here is the control of water, which is precious in the Middle East. While Palestinians often don't have enough running water, sometimes none at all in the heat of summer, the settlers seldom run out. And the symbol of the occupation is this wall. The thing that is striking about this settlement is that it's, it's like a fortress. I mean, this is like a Berlin Wall. Like the Berlin Wall, very bad. We don't feel uh, comfortable. Mm. Uh, we lived here, and uh, I'm here for 15 years without these walls, fences, and everything. We lived very normal. This uh, last year changed all, all the rules in the area. Yeah. Everything was changed. The justification for taking somebody else's land is biblical. That God gave them Palestine, and God, not the history of others, is their witness. I'm here because it's obvious. That's my place. It's not something it's in my hands that we can, you know, we can give it back. Not me, not any politician uh, or, or, or any, anybody or uh, um, par parliament or whatever. Because it's, it's a movement. It's something that comes 3,000 years ago when Moses brought us here. And we have in our mind, we have the dream of building a temple in Jerusalem. It's something a lot bigger than religion. Where, where will it end, though, if there's no compromise? Doesn't that mean conflict? Where? Life is full with conflicts. I don't know what to say. I know. Maybe I'm saying something too strong. It's one zero game. We will fight. The conflict is here. We will fight. It's one zero game, not to kill each other. But it's us or them. On the other side of the wall is the reality of Palestine. At yet another checkpoint, people are waiting and waiting. Let me just take you in a journey from Gaza to Khan Yunis. This normal journey usually takes 20 minutes to reach from Gaza town to Khan Yunis. 
But after this checkpoint, this journey sometimes takes people from four to nine hours. People, as you see here, waiting to go from Gaza to Khan Yunis to, to guarantee the security of the passage of two or three settlers. Yeah. So it is the security... So two or three security. settlers will drive along here. In the meantime, all this traffic has to bank up. Exactly. How long will these people be here, do you think? Just at a guess. These people, they will stay till tomorrow morning because the road is closed now. It will not be reopened until tomorrow morning, 7 o'clock in the morning. Dr. El Farah's family used to own land near this crossing. The Israelis confiscated it and demolished a home. And this is typical of what happens almost every day in occupied Palestine. They demolished my house and uh, another 26 houses the same night. I call it terrorism. Here I call it terrorism. How long had your family lived there? Maybe back to 900 years. We were in the same place. I feel angry. I feel uh, dev devastated. I feel abandoned by the world. Let me fr be frank with you. I feel that nobody is taking care of us. This is Gaza, just a few miles down the road from the affluence of the Israeli settlement. The contrast is extraordinary. Almost a million Palestinians are trapped behind electrified barbed wire and roadblocks. Always waiting for invasion, their defenses are pathetic mounds of sand. Fear has a permanent presence. Waiting for the invasion is worse than the invasion itself. Because you're waiting, you don't know when, where, and how they will hit to, or come in. The first time they bombed in Gaza, I was there in another flat, and we had children, many children in the, in the building. And oh, I heard all the children and their mothers screaming and crying. The half-built buildings of Gaza are a testament to the hopes raised, then dashed, by the talk of an independent Palestine. Without Israeli permission, most people can't leave and they can't return. They can't get to jobs. Their produce can't get to market. Most struggle to live on about a pound a day, a poverty compounded by an Israeli policy called closure. You see, for Israel to sustain this unsustainable occupation, it is transforming every city and every Palestinian town and village into a prison, basically. Surrounded by tanks, surrounded by walls, surrounded by fences. And it's not like they're building a border between us and Israel. It's building borders inside West Bank and Gaza, between our cities and towns for the sake of their settlements. They are obliging us to be occupied people and not citizens. The United States, Mr. Prime Minister, has been proud of its association with the State of Israel. Rest assured that the security of Israel is a principal objective of this administration. I want everybody to know, should I be the president, Israel is going to be our friend. I'm going to stand by Israel. Israel's occupation of Palestine would not be possible without the backing of America. In the oil-rich Middle East, Israel is America's deputy sheriff, receiving billions of dollars along with the latest weapons, F-16 aircraft, bombs, missiles, Apache helicopters. Today, Israel is the fourth largest military power in the world, and it has nuclear weapons. We, we saw an Apache helicopter circling in the sky above our heads, then shooting a missile. The rockets fell just 200 meters from our house. All our windows were shattered. I had a child in front of me, my daughter, who was 11 years old, shivering from fear, worried, frightened to death. And I could do nothing to protect her. And you don't know whether 
in the second minute, you or your daughter will be dead. That feeling of impotence is indescribable, and I will never forget it. This is bomb damage in Gaza. Although America is Israel's main arms supplier, it's not widely recognized that Britain also fuels the conflict here, even though it condemns Israel for its illegal occupation. During the first 14 months of the Palestinian uprising, the Blair government approved 230 export licenses for weapons and military equipment to Israel. The categories these covered included large caliber weapons, ammunition, bombs, and vital parts for military aircraft that almost certainly included American supplied combat helicopters. You may have seen these Apache gunships on the news firing missiles at densely populated areas. Tony Blair has said, and I quote him, we are doing everything we can to bring peace and stability to the Middle East. As much as they humiliate us and uh, uh, kill us and destroy our land, destroy everything we do, our schools, our, organ our organizations, infrastructure, everything they like to destroy. But this gives us more power to continue and resist. In the news we get, only the Palestinians are described as terrorists. And yet the Israelis have a long history of terrorism, both before and since the founding of the Jewish state. At least three Israeli prime ministers have been involved in campaigns of terror. The tragic scene is like a serious incident during the Blitz. The hotel housed the British Army headquarters and the Palestine government offices, and casualties were very heavy. The commander of the terrorist group that blew up the King David Hotel in Jerusalem in 1946 was Manaikan Begin. 91 people were killed. Manaikan Begin was Israeli prime minister in the 70s and 80s. He once described a massacre as a splendid act of conquest. Yitzhak Shamir was prime minister until 1992. He had been a leader of a Jewish group called the Stern Gang which carried out a string of assassinations. When those Israelis, who are now famous names, committed acts of terrorism just before the birth of Israel, you could have said to them, nothing justifies what you've done, ripping apart all those lives. And they would say, it did justify it. Well, What's the difference? I think we have now, as an international community, come to a new understanding. I think after September 11th, the world got a wake-up call. Because terrorism today is no longer the mad bomber, the anarchist who throws in a, an explosive device into a crowd to make a point. Terrorism is going to move from the present situation to non-conventional terrorism, to nuclear terrorism. And before we re reach that point, we have to remove this scourge from the earth. And therefore, whether you're talking about the struggle here between Israelis and Palestinians, the struggle in Northern Ireland, the struggle in Sri Lanka, or any of the places where terrorism has been used, we must make a global commitment of all free democracies to eliminate this threat from the world, period. Does that include state terrorism? No country has the right to deliberately target civilians, as no organization has a right to deliberately target civilians. That's what Israelis have been doing for years. The present Israeli Prime Minister, Ariel Sharon, has long been involved in terror. In 1983, he was found indirectly but personally responsible for a civilian massacre by Lebanese militia in two Palestinian refugee camps. At least 800 innocent people were murdered in cold blood, most of them Palestinians. What about Israeli terrorism now? The language of terrorism you have to be very careful with. Terrorism means deliberately targeting civilians in a kind of warfare. 
That's what the terrorism against Israeli schools, coffee shops, malls has been all about. Israel specifically targets, to the best of its ability, uh, Palestinian terrorist organizations. All right. when, when, when an Israeli sniper shoots an old lady with a cane trying to get into a hospital for her chemotherapy tr treatment in front of uh, a lot of the world's press, for one, and frankly we'd be here all day with other examples, isn't that terrorism? I don't know the case you're speaking about, but I can be convinced of one thing. Mm -hmm. An Israeli who takes aim, even an Israeli sniper, is taking aim at those engaged in terrorism. Unfortunately, in every kind of warfare, there are cases of civilians who are accidentally killed. Terrorism means putting the crosshairs of the sniper's rifle on a civilian deliberately. Well, that's, that that's what I just what, described. No, I can tell you that did not happen. It did happen, and, and I think that's where some people have problem with the argument that terrorism exists on, on one side. Your definition is absolutely correct about civilians, and those suicide bombers are terrorists. If but, you mix terrorism and counterterrorism, if you create some kind of moral obfuscation, you will bring about not just a problem for Israel, but you will bring, a, bring about a problem for the entire Western alliance, because we are all facing this threat. It's hard to see the difference between what the Israelis call counter-terrorism and terrorism. Whatever the target, both involve the killing of innocent people. This is what happened when Prime Minister Sharon sent tanks into Bethlehem earlier this year. We had a day before a private hospital director who was uh, going from the hospital in Al Khadr to Bethlehem to get supplies for his hospital. His plate number was known to the soldier. His name was known to the soldier and they knew that he is the director of a hospital, but he was shot by a high velocity bullet. In 1988, the Palestine Liberation Organization, led by Yasser Arafat, recognized Israel's right to exist and Israeli sovereignty over 78% of Palestine. It was an historic compromise. And in the early 90s, a breakthrough for peace seemed possible. It was in this room in a Jerusalem hotel that the first direct talks between Israeli and Palestinian officials took place in 1991. These led to further meetings and an agreement in the Norwegian capital, Oslo, that set up an autonomous mini-state in the territories occupied by Israel since 1967. For Yasser Arafat and his people, it was seen as a beginning, but the reality was different. What the majority of Palestinians got was a classic colonial fix. Arafat and his elite got the trappings and privileges of power, while the mass of the people got what one Israeli journalist called the autonomy of a prisoner of war camp. In July 2000, the two sides met in America to reach a final agreement. But among the issues they discussed was a profound disagreement about just how much land was on offer. Israel's Prime Minister at the time, Ehud Barak, claimed he'd offered the Palestinians almost all the occupied territories back and said that Arafat had rejected this. In reality, the Israelis were expanding more and more illegal settlements on Palestinian land, even during the negotiations. Add to that the special access roads with their checkpoints, and the Palestinians say that all that was left was a group of colonies with their borders patrolled by military bases. It's very important to understand that from a Palestinian point of view, they were asked to sign in the end of the day a document which did not relate even to one of the central issues for which they had been struggling for more than 100 years. 
they are left eventually with an offer of 10% of what used to be Palestine. The Israelis who dictated this offer in the summer of 2000 are not even talking about a proper state. We're talking in that area of a stateless state, I would call it, a Bantustan, with no genuine sovereignty, with no independent foreign economic or political policies, uh, with no proper capital, uh, and at the mercy of the Israeli security services and the Israeli policy. Not only that, but there is now documented evidence that the Palestinians had made an extraordinary offer to the Israelis, conceding even more of their land. But this was not news at the time. If there is no justice for the Palestinians, there will be a reckoning in the young generation. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أنا اسمي خالد دحلان اليوم رح نلتقي مع بعض أنا وياكو علشان نعمل اللي هو اللقاء حول الرسم الحر. Dr. Dahlan runs a project for children in Gaza. He asked these boys to draw anything that was on their minds. Most of these children are traumatized by the fear and violence of the occupation. The majority of our children exposed directly to the uh, attack or to the bombardment by the Israeli army is uh, traumatized. There is many, many uh, symptoms. Children became anxious and uh, depressed and uh, make, for example, uh, sleep disorder as uh, nightmares or sleepwalking or something like that. Many, many uh, ch uh, children, they cannot concentrate well to study. Nearly every drawing is of violence. Nearly every family in Gaza has lost someone, either to an Israeli jail or to violence. Dr. Dalan's goal is to help the children keep the last thing that belongs to them, their sanity and their life. Ah, uh, there is a conflict between the Israeli soldiers with the tanks and the Palestinian kids who threw stones mm. and uh, they cry la ilaha illallah there is no god except Allah what children in other parts of the world would draw as fantasy they draw here as real life yes war in violence this is a good thing to protect the children from the uh, mental disease I don't want my child that I've been working on having for 15 years to come and when he's 10 years old, he goes to a settlement and he wants to kill his wife. And the only way, the only way to stop all this suffering, now I will say it on both sides too, is to have a Palestinian state according to UN resolutions. When will Israel agree to negotiate with the Palestinians, not for what they call a few bantustans on the West Bank, but for a state that is as peaceful, as secure, above all, as independent as Israel itself. Do you want Israel to um, concede the terms of that negotiation up front on television? Or is it better to agree to the general principle well, well, what, and then okay. sit with the Palestinians in a face-to-face -face negotiation once they stop violence against us. Well, what about this, the general principle then of a, a, a state as independent, as independent as Israel? We do not need a string of adjectives to agree to. You agree to the principle. Well, that's a fair principle, isn't it? What's, what's a state worth if it isn't independent? What we're speaking about is our willingness to negotiate with the Palestinians, their self-government, and we are willing to create a Palestinian self-governing entity, some call it a Palestinian state, which will address the real needs of the Palestinians. What right have you to create somebody else's homeland? Well, we are being asked to negotiate that. We are willing to be part of that. We're willing to make a contribution to that. 
we are not going to upfront go into details about its geographic configuration or its powers. That's part of the negotiation. I support sanctions, uh, selective sanctions on Israel because I tell my uh, friends here and my colleagues, I would rather have you pay an economic price than pay the price I think you will pay in, in terms of human lives. The, the stronger party in the conflict, Israel, has to understand that there is a price for going on with the policies it carries. What do you say to those fellow Israelis who will inevitably come up with um, the view that in the end we're going to be pushed into the sea. This expression will be pushed in... By this mosquito, we are the most powerful power in the Middle East. We have one of the greatest and more powerful armies in the world. In this last operation, there were four divisions, armored divisions, against some 500, 2,000 armed people. It, it's a laugh. Who will push us into the sea? Until recently, Israel has enjoyed almost an immunity from criticism among Western politicians. This has been largely due to a fear of being labelled anti-Semitic, a fear manipulated by the Israeli government and its foreign lobbies. I think the Holocaust memory does not allow any moral criticism of anything that Israel does. Europeans in particular, and the outside world in general, are not allowed to voice criticism on Israel un unless, again, uh, what Israel is doing is akin to what the Germans had done uh, to the Jews. And if you do criticize Israel, you are immediately charged with anti-Semitism. This is, you know, a huge... Uh, a, a bluff of, 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 you know, of the Israeli establishment, that every, you know, criticism of its policy is anti-Semitism. And criticizing your government, your country's policy is today, I think, in the only patriotic thing where one can do. The Israeli government denies it, but Palestinians fear that there are plans to take all of Palestine, trapping or expelling them indefinitely. We are not against the Jews. And that's why I have Jewish friends. We are against, politically, the governments of Israel and the army of Israel who denies our rights. And I hope, I hope to have peace here with the, with the Israelis. But with dignity, this is very important for us. With dignity, it means with our full rights. The Palestinians will never be destroyed. They will never disappear. We are not the Red Indians. We will not be cancelled from history just like this, no. It is not surprising that the Jewish people of Israel should feel insecure. No one should ever forget that the most devastating genocide in human history happened only two generations ago. But a true sensitivity to that awful memory comes from the same basic humanity that recognizes the suffering of the Palestinian people and the courage of their endurance. The truth is that Israelis will never have peace until they recognize that Palestinians have the same right to the same peace and the same independence that they enjoy. Recently, that great voice of freedom, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, asked this. Have the Jewish people of Israel forgotten their collective punishment, their home demolitions, their humiliations so soon? Israel's own dissenting voices have not forgotten and those who speak out in this film honor the best traditions of Jewish humanity. If Rami, the man who lost a young daughter in a suicide attack, can understand the root cause of the violence here, isn't it time that others broke their silence? The occupation of Palestine should end now. Then the solution is clear. 
two countries, Israel and Palestine, neither dominating nor menacing the other. Is that impossible? Or is history to witness the consequences of yet another silence? Well, thank you um, for watching that film by excellent film by John Pilger, who's joined us to discuss that 2002 documentary with Israeli historian Ilan Pape, who was, of course, in the film as well. But before we begin, I just wanted to mention to our audience, particularly those who tried to watch us on YouTube or on the Consortium News website, that we found out that 16 minutes into the film, while we had already started John's documentary, that YouTube took down uh, our show basically uh, stopped the broadcast and claims that we are broke their community rules, which include spam. Uh, so this is a bit, shouldn't be shocking. And I don't like the C word. I don't like throwing the C word around too much. That's the censorship, but something weird has happened. And um, we are still streaming on Twitter, but not on YouTube. And I wanted to uh, ask Elizabeth to talk to, to Elon because before we went on, uh, we had a small chat about this type of thing and what may have happened. We don't know what happened, why YouTube took us down, but Elizabeth. Yeah, Elon, I was wanting to ask you about uh, what capability Israel has in terms of interfering with social media. Yes, well, uh, first of all, uh, good to see John. He's still unmuted, but uh, and say hello to him <laughs> and um, thank you for having me uh, on this show i'm really happy uh, to be here since 2010 uh, uh, israel has a special ministry the ministry of strategic affairs that uh, takes very seriously the uh, kind of information that flows on the internet uh, uh, which really represents the civil society uh, position on palestine in the world israel is never worried too much about government's position, political elite's position in Israel. They're doing very well in that field, but they're very worried about the social media that, which represents the, the wider audiences. And of course, the tendency has been since uh, 1982 uh, uh, was to, to support the Palestinian cause and, and, and be aware of the Israeli uh, policies and criticize them. Uh, so uh, one of the means that Israel is using is uh, apart from being present in that uh, uh, domain, uh, is to disrupt whenever they can uh, such communications. I don't think it's very easy to find out how they do it, what they exactly do, but I wouldn't put beyond them uh, to stifle the debate and discussion on Palestine by uh, various means, because they really feel that this undermines uh, Israel's international legitimacy, uh, which has been significantly eroded uh, in recent years. Yeah, we'll be speaking about that. Uh, so I'm welcoming again, Elon and John Pilger. We're gonna talk about John's film uh, and the changes of the last 20 years in Palestine and uh, looking at the future. I, I, I encourage you, John and Elon, to speak to one another as well during this broadcast, ask each other some questions, but I'm gonna prompt you and I'll start with John. It's a really tremendous film, John. I watched it for the second time. Today, it's because it really shows the human consequences of this conflict. And I know that there's been one change since 2002, and that has to do with you and your position. At the end of the film, you say you uh -huh. agree with the two-state solution. Now, you told me uh, that has changed. Tell me about why you've changed your position on that. Well, when that film first went out in London uh, at the... It was previewed at the Institute of Contemporary Arts, and I was actually sitting next to um, 
Elan. And uh, he, um, uh, at the end of the screening, he leaned over and I paraphrase him here. <laughs> I agree with all I like that very much. I have to say that Elan was the historical advisor on the film. So he, um, he's, uh, we were distinguished by his his help, but he bears a bit of responsibility, though I don't give him the responsibility for my final camera piece anyway. He said, except, except your concluding remarks. And I agree with him 100%. Uh, you know, so much has changed, but so much has not changed. And that's that's the truth about, uh, for me, that's the truth about Palestine. And uh, I don't believe, I can't imagine. In fact, it's difficult for me even thinking I would write that piece now. But I suppose I was aware that the film was also appealing to, it was appealing to an audience uh, of, what I would call an audience of persuasion. And in those days, 2002, in the, uh, the, at the time of Oslo, even the term peace process had a certain credibility then. Um, it has none now. And Alain was well ahead of us. Uh, probably has been, well, he certainly has been since he wrote his his first book, but uh, uh, it it there uh, there was so much of a deception in our hopes. Then we were being deceived all the time, and uh, I mean, I look back on what Thomas Pickering, the former Israeli ambassador, U.S. Uh, uh, ambassador to Israel, <laughs> said this year, and he said. Uh, I, I can't remember exactly the context. He said, two states, yes, 4.4% um, for the Palestinians. Um, so it was all a sham. Mm. Uh, otherwise, nothing else in the film. Basically, uh, Palestine is still the issue and all the issues raised by some of those extraordinary people, not least by Alain himself, one of the, the bravest of those who have stood up. And I don't know I'm slightly ahead of myself here, but I wanted to, one of the things I did ask Alain in the film, I think it was in the film, I did certainly ask him, it's in my notes, what was the price of speaking out? And you answered Alain, isolation. Uh, you no doubt qualified that, but it'd be very interesting to hear it's almost 20 years what has happened since then in your own speaking out. Yeah. Thank you, John. Yes, uh, we have to remember uh, you asked me that question really at the beginning of the, of the century, 2001, 2002, uh, when I was really at the center of the attention of mm. the Israeli academic and educational system, and I was still living fully in Israel. And I, was, I wasn't prepared for the kind of avalanche that would be followed in terms of uh, becoming enemy number one, not for a long time, thank God, but long enough uh, for it to, to uh, create a, a sense of physical insecurity, I mean, real insecurity, death threats, and so on. Um, and uh, feeling that uh, you're totally alone because you don't have a reference group. You're not a Palestinian that can sort of rely on the Palestinian society. Uh, and, and working without a reference group is, is very difficult. I mean, even if you are very oppressed and, and occupied, the fact that you belong organically to the occupied people or colonized peoples means that you have, there is a network there. But when you are not there and not there, uh, this was, I think, the, 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 so I think I described it quite accurately when I thought 
it was more than isolation than fear, for instance, or, uh, or at any given moment thinking that because of that, I would change anything what I'm doing. Fortunately, two things happened, which really make me feel much more secure today and less isolated. I think in the past 20 years, I won the confidence uh, of the Palestinian people. Uh, and not surprisingly, uh, and you know it, uh, John, from other places in the world you have so brilliantly told us about, uh, when the, someone from the privileged side offers solidarity with the other side, they're not immediately accepted as genuine. And rightly so, by the way, because so many of those people are not genuine. And it takes time to build that confidence, you know, that, that you are genuinely uh, thinking what you are saying, you know, and, and, and that I think happened. And, and that, so I do have now a reference group of Palestinian uh, people, especially the Palestinian community inside Israel. And that gives you a lot of strength. And secondly, I've uh, decided that, well, I, I had no choice. I was expelled from my university in 2007, a few years after the film. Maybe even the film was uh, mentioned in the indictment. It was so long, the, the indictment that they brought against me in the trial uh, at the university. Uh, I'm sure the film was one of, one of the reference points to show my, my betrayal and, and treason. Uh, I moved to England, and uh, although I'm on the line, I try and visit and be in Israel and Palestine as much as I can, I have a different academic infrastructure behind me in the University of Exeter, which is very supportive uh, and allows me to do things that I, I couldn't do even before I was expelled from the Israeli uh, academia. So at least on a personal level, the situation is better. But as you say, unfortunately, on the more general level, and we'll talk about it, I'm sure, it is so frustrating to see the film and say to yourself, well, if John would have went, gone around with the camera today, he would bring the same images. He would bring out the same story. There would, if, if anything, it's much of the same, but worse, so yeah. to speak, other than any improvement in any aspect that you describe in the film. It's, it's horrific that after 20 years, we cannot report any improvement in terms of welfare, humanity. Uh, if anything, we can report more of it and worse of it. And so my questions are going to suggest that things have gotten worse. John, but to talk, put on the line uh, the first question, your change, of course, was no longer believing in a two-state solution, but in one state where everybody has a vote. And that's obviously what Israel has been resisting and will continue to, I guess. Uh, but I just want to make this point. A lot of people in Western people say, well, that conflict is so complicated and it's about religion and they have a sort of equally blame both sides and they just don't want to deal with that you know it, it, your film simplifies it in my view but boils it down to a colonial um conquest of a land and a resistance of indigenous people and it's that's like any other that has happened too many times throughout history isn't that isn't that right john isn't it basically that's the core issue yes yes uh that was the that was the task of course everything is complicated but it's the job of journalism to, um, to communicate it to people without oversimplifying it. That's, and that's what that film set out to do. But um, it had to go through, I have to say, to put out a fairly simple message. And for me, an obvious message, as you say, Joe, uh, for me, Israel is a, an anachronism. It's, a, it's an example of, of the time of, just as the world was decolonizing, along comes a new, a new colony. And we've had to live with the, the, uh, the implications, the problems of that ever since. But the, the uh, uh, in order to put out that straightforward message, the film had to go through fire. I was, when the film went to air and it was broadcast here in the UK on ITV and then around the world, uh, to, <clears throat> although a late night audience, a large audience, uh, it was 
it was attacked, it was praised actually more than it was attacked, but it was attacked by something that foretold what is now fairly common. And that is a kind of mass attack via social media. Much of it orchestrated, much of the attack on this film was orchestrated interestingly from the United States by an organization, a Zionist organization called Honest Reporting, ironically, and one or two others. So generic emails, generic messages, generic attacks were set up to undermine the film. And in the end, the regulatory body here, the ITC, uh, probably uh, had no uh, option but to investigate it. And they spent six months investigating the film. My producer and I, and with a lawyer, and from time to time with Alain's help, had to write the equivalent of a thesis to justify every frame, every word that was spoken. But that's only ever happened to me in quite a few years of journalism. It's happened sort of with other films, but with this issue, uh, we had to comb through it. Uh, I had to ask his son to justify how he, he could possibly pour historical scorn on, on the, the myth that Israel was, was, the, uh, was the victim in the 67 war. Uh, well, it goes back to what you said at the beginning, Joe. It's, it's complicated and people can throw their arms up only because they're held in a state of permanent ignorance. And when that ignorance dissipates, it's not that it's not complicated, but they're able to see it. Uh, and Israel's layer upon layer upon layer of myths carefully constructed, the 67 war, which one of them, in all of Ilan's books, that's what's made them so, so valuable and why he himself has had to undergo attacks, but the sort of tax that honor your work really, um, that it, 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 it came down to that Israel was an imperial, a colonial experiment. The wars, so-called wars fought there, that is the attacks on the Palestinian people, are American and British wars because they're fueled by that. Without that sponsorship, they wouldn't happen. Uh, the, uh, the ma many of the, like, uh, uh, one of the Israeli uh, favorite, long-time favorite punishments of Palestinians is house demolitions. That came from the British. Uh, that's what they used to do in Palestine. Um, so it, it, th there was even a, there was even a, 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 a they were the the whole application of empire as it's applied by the by certainly by the British by the Americans and now by the Israelis and in the Israelis case all over the world now uh, was demonstrated in that film the people refusing to be ethnically cleansed even though everything right from the beginning, as Alain's, Alain's recent books has described, the plans to turn them all into a prison, uh, even though they've, they haven't thwarted it, but their very survival has, has sort of denied it. Um, that's all colonial. And that's still the issue. That's still the story. And that's why media reporting absolutely is cleansed of any reference to this, to colonialism. It's, well, mind you, it's cleansed of any reference to the law, to any form of morality, so that um, people, a BBC reporter can stand in, a, in the rubble of somebody's house that's just been bombed by the Israelis and describe it as, as uh, the war on terrorism. Um, that, that is central 
that understanding of this imperial, this imperial act, this imperial ongoing well, atrocity, of course, uh, is, is, is so important to understand. Well, the fact that the UN General Assembly uh, blessed the creation of Israel takes it out of the possibility of a trusteeship. You know, I'm, I had an office at the UN for many years looking over the trusteeship council, which is moribund. It doesn't exist anymore. The last trustee was Palau. And the idea of creating Palestine as a trustee is something that outside the norm. But I wanted to pick up your theme, John, about myths and uh, particularly the creation myths. Every nation seems to have Elon a creation myth upon which the establishment uh, rules, they depend on this to rule and they guard it from their own people. So if their people should find out that this is a myth, it would undermine their rule. So you've written so widely about this in so many of your books, particularly the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. I thought you could quickly, for an audience who don't understand this point yet, how crucial it is. What is the creation myth of Israel that you were able to uncover. Just if you lay out some of the uh, research that you were able to do after the archives were opened up, the British and um, and even Israeli archives. It's a um, it's a series of of mythologies, if you want, or myths. It's not just one myth that it kind of builds one on the other, and they are kind of chronologically organized in a way that makes it easier, I think, for someone who is. Uh, just now initiated into this uh, debate uh, to follow, because it begins with a very important myth uh, that was shared by the British Empire, as John, as John mentioned, Israel as a state could not have been established without uh, the, the help of the British Empire. And this is the myth that Palestine was a land without people. And the second half of the myth was that the Jews were people without land. And in fact, defining the Jews as a race by itself, as a nation by itself, by British policy makers uh, on the eve of the Balfour Declaration uh, was by itself anti-Semitic. It meant that you cannot, it meant you cannot be an Anglo-Jew because you belong to a different nation, you belong to a different race. So anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, I'm uh, sorry, anti-Semitism and Zionism were some kind of, uh, you know, helping each other in creating the ideological myth that allowed Britain to declare that Palestine is an empty space to which the Jews of Europe could immigrate and settle in. So that's one, 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 one myth. The other one has to do, of course, with, with what happened in, in 1948. Until today, you open the website of the Israeli Foreign Ministry, they will tell you that what happened in 48 was uh, a very uh, fair United Nation offering to divide Palestine between a Jewish state and an Arab state. The Palestinians encouraged by Arab neighboring states rejected this uh, uh, fair solution and uh, told the people of Palestine to leave, to make way for the invading Arab armies that came to destroy uh, the Jewish state. Once we uh, had access to documents in the Israeli archives, in the British archives, in the United Nation archives, which something we, we were able to do in the early 1980s as professional historians, we saw that actually long time Palestinian claim that this Israeli narrative is a fabrication, is a propaganda which is not based on facts, came to light because the documents showed without any uh, doubt that what happened was that the Zionist leadership from the 1930s onwards planned the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, it believed that it should take as much of Palestine as possible and have in it as few Palestinians as possible. Whether they always weighed, whether they had the capacity, whether these were the right historical circumstances for implementing this idea and uh, the end of the British mandate in 1947, gave them the historical opportunity and they had enough military power by that moment to try and implement the idea of ethnic cleansing and turn it into an operative, operative program on the ground. One of the most important effects that is always obfuscated by the Israelis 
because they have this clear narrative which is sell to everyone, which is the Arab world started the war. The war created a refugee problem. These refugees were leaving Palestine because the Arab leaders told them. So, you know, even if you're a liberal Zionist, you say, you know, after a war, there are refugees. What can, what can you do? Uh, or it's their fault because they left voluntarily. What we, we show very clearly from the documents that before the creation of the State of Israel, the 15th of May, 1948, before one Arab soldier entered Palestine, already hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were expelled by the, Israel, by the Jewish forces. They would become the Israeli forces. All the Palestinian towns have been de-Arabized, have been emptied of their Arab Palestinian inhabitants before May, 1948. So actually this narrative that you can hear, you, I heard it even from President Obama in one of his speeches, that what could Israel do because all these Arab armies came with only one intention, which is to destroy the young Jewish state. No, they were forced by their public opinion to do something to stop an ethnic cleansing that was already halfway through when the Arab armies entered Palestine to try and salvage. And in fact, had the Arab armies not entered Palestine, instead of half of the Palestinian population becoming refugee, the whole of the Palestinian refugees would have become in refugees. There wouldn't be one Palestinian left in Palestine. So, so I think uh, this is something that is very important to explain because Palestinians became refugees because they were victims of an ethnic cleansing ideology and an ethnic cleansing operation. What is no less important is that because the international community did not condemn this ethnic cleansing as a crime, the, and because it was incomplete, not the whole of Palestine belonged to Israel, and not all the Palestinians became refugees, Israel continues to this very day, the ethnic cleansing operation. It, this ideology and strategy informs every Israeli action towards the Palestinians, wherever they are, whether it's an action that is inflicted on one individual, or whether it's a far more uh, you know, expanded operation of ethnic cleansing or occupation or assault. Uh, it's been going on for 73 years in different parts of Palestine and towards different segments of the Palestinian community. And yet the Western mainstream media refuses to call it in the right name that they should call it and accept the Israeli vocabulary that these are all Israeli reactions to Palestinian terrorism and violence, rather than seeing this as chapter in the long history of state terrorism uh, uh, that is fueled by an ideology, a racist ideology, which believes that Palestine is <laughs> the Jewish people. You know, one of your most uh, one of the important sources in your books are Ben Gurion's own diaries, which lay out mm -hmm. these plans. I want to ask you, uh, one of the mo most important things uh, in your research is the number of massacres that took place. You talk about villages that are now paved over as car parks in uh, Israeli car parks, underneath which was an Israeli village. Why is Dier Yassin always talked about? Is that the one they offered up so they could show, well, one of them happened? Why is that one have accepted when there were so many other massacres that have been forgotten or repressed the information about them? Well, there is an historical reason for this. It starts with uh, a day after the massacre. The massacre of Yuri Asim took place on the 9th of April, 1948, and there were already massacres before it, and as you say, many massacres after it. But um, there were two reasons that uh, uh, the Zionist leadership decided to uh, publicize uh, that particular massacre. For the leader of the Zionist movement and the first prime minister of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, this was a chance to kind of point out to the exception that does not tell you the rule. So it kind of uh, uh, built into a narrative which, yes, some of our more right-wing uh, uh, friends uh, uh, went out of the way, uh, but we don't do these things. Wh whereas actually the mainstream kind of military forces, which he commanded himself, committed even worse massacres than, than Diriasi. The second reason was that and Menachem Begin, who was the leader of the Irgun, the, the body that was the main uh, perpetrator of that particular massacre, 
he writes it in his memoirs. He writes it very much in memoirs. He said, this proved to be a very useful uh, propaganda that intimidated Palestinians before the occupation, telling them, if you are not leaving the village, what would happen to you is the Deir Yassin massacre. In fact, I found pamphlets that the Israeli Air Force used to distribute from the air uh, uh, to uh, villages on the ground few hours before the, uh, the village would be occupied by Israeli forces, in which the Deir Yassin massacre is mentioned, hoping that it would trigger a flight by the locals so that the Israelis don't have to actively uh, expel these people from, from, from the ground. But yes, yes, the picture is, in any ethnic lending operation, uh, it, there is a point where villages and city dwellers and indigenous people resist expulsion. And when so they resist expulsion, there is a massacre. By admitting one, it sort of helps their credibility that uh, they didn't do all the ones. We are not 100% pure, yeah, right. only 99.9%. Now, I want to ask you one more question, Ilan, and then we'll turn it over to Elizabeth. Um, on one of my several trips to Palestine and Israel, I, I made it a point to ask every Israeli I met, why, why do they hate you? Why do they hate you so much? And I found that the more educated the Israeli was, the more they admitted because we took their land away and we continue an occupation. And the less educated they are was because they hate us because we're Jews. So when you look at how the elite, some of the elite leaders of Israel, like uh, Moshe Dayan, and uh, John quotes one of him, uh, one of the quotes from Moshe Dayan in the film, there's not a single place built in this country that did not have a former Arab population. And uh, Moshe Dayan said that uh, we, we, we have no... We, what calls do we have to complain about their hatred to us? For eight years now, they sit in their refugee camps in Gaza, and before their eyes, we turned into our homestead, the land of villages in which their forefathers have lived. And more recently, we have Ehud Barak saying uh, that as long as the ter in, the ter in this territory west of the Jordan River, there's only one political entity called Israel is going to be either non-Jewish or non-democratic. If this block of millions of Palestinians cannot vote, that will be an apartheid state. I have other examples, but my question to you is why do, why do they make, why do they so publicly admit this and still the myth persists? Why do they do that? Why do they think they can get away with that? Why do they get away with it? <laughs> I think that there, there is here uh, an historical development that you have to, to recognize. Until 1977, uh, the Israeli political and cultural and social scene was dominated by the Israeli Labour Party, if you want, by the liberal Zionists, in a way, who perpetrated the, these awful crimes against the Palestinians. But uh, there was a sense that this will not go down well with the international community and also with the location where Israel hopes to get some support, including but from liberal Jews and definitely from progressive people around the world. Uh, you have to remember the left supported Israel until 1967. Mm -hmm. We forget it. West, the left in the West was mm -hmm. Israel's main supporting uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, reference group, if you, if you want. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I think until 1977, they were playing these games by which they tried to square the circle, um, explaining that this was exceptional. Uh, you, you might remember uh, Golda Meir's famous saying, we will never forgive the Arabs for what they forced us to do to them, right? Uh, uh, this is the kind of, uh, this was the mentality. Now, the right wing works in a very different way uh, uh, in Israel. It, it, um, it doesn't want at all to deal with the moral issue. And therefore it, it has this idea that uh, all you have to do is prove that this is a new form of anti-Semitism. The Palestinians are just a continuation of the Nazis or anti-Semitic uh, 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 groups and ideological movements. And therefore, whatever you do to them uh, is justified because this is self-defense and, and, and survival against uh, uh, horrific people. The big question for me on this is because uh, this is what we should ask ourselves, how long would liberal Jews around the world say to themselves, uh, you know, the red lines have been crossed. Now that the discourse is so open, is so clear, they don't even have a shame. They say, you know, openly, as you say, Joe, uh, can they go on supporting an apartheid state which says I'm apartheid state? 
that passes a 2018 apartheid nationality law. I mean, the, the Labour Party would never pass such a law. It would be afraid of what the liberal Jews would say, or the Democratic Party in America uh, was the main supporter of Israel until uh, recently would say. They are not playing this game anymore. And the big surprise is that the people who may have blinded themselves intentionally or unintentionally, you ask yourself, can you not now see? Now, if they can't see it, it means that they're racist themselves, that they don't have the moral backbone to, to recognize that the Palestinians are human beings like all of us, and they cannot be treated the way that they're treated. Mm. Yeah. Alana, I, w- I wanted to ask you about how your scholarship has been received and how that's changed over time, if you've faced more censorship over time, or if things are shifting in a way where uh, people are more open to, to the upending of the official narrative that you present. Well, in Israel, no, I'm, I'm still not, uh, not making waves, so to speak. I mean, there is a small group in the civil society among the younger generation that I think uh, is getting there. I, I, for the first time, I succeeded in finding a publisher who was willing to publish my 2007 book, The Esther Cleansing in Hebrew. It just came out this year. To my great surprise, apart from the liberal Zionist newspaper, Arabs, because I really irritate the liberal Zionists. They cannot stand me. But everywhere else, including kind of right-wing uh, newspapers, had actually received the book quite well in terms of we believe him that this is what happened, but we want morally to argue with him or accept some of it. So I was surprised. So maybe something is a little bit changing. I don't know. It's too early days for that. But of course, internationally, uh, this, uh, not only my, my book, but many works like this contribute to changing the discourse and perspective, uh, but that's outside of Israel. But even inside Israel, and I will finish uh, quickly this answer, uh, my previous vice chancellor in the University of Exeter, Sir Stephen Smith, can tell you that from the moment I was appointed as a professor of history at the University of Exeter, once a week, more or less, the phone rang in his office, and it was either the Israeli ambassador or a, or a politician <laughs> pushed oh prodded by, by the Israeli embassy to ask, why are you still keeping this man in the position of professorship? The pressure was immense on the university to, uh, to get rid of me. Uh, so I, I feel the pressure. The pressure is there all the time. Uh, they don't, it's a relentless uh, attempt to disqualify your scholarship, your professional uh, standing. Uh, but what they don't take into account, of course, and John knows it, as the year goes by, you are totally at peace with yourself. You are sure that what you're doing is right. They cannot undermine your confidence in what you are doing. And as time passes by, most of the people do not buy their uh, smear campaigns and defamations and so on. So I, I'm less worried about it. That we are all, and I know it, and the film shows it. But what we are really worried is that they create uh, a shield of immunity. They create a shield of immunity that even people like us cannot penetrate, that allows them on a daily basis to uh, harass, occupy, uh, 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 demolish, colonize, expel, do all these awful things on a daily basis to the Palestinians without any uh, force they're able to stop them. Uh, and, and I think that's what is so worrying, that, that the shield is still working. It's strong enough to allow them that immunity. Uh, despite the very positive changes we have seen in public opinion in the West and in, beyond the West, civil society, the boycott and investment and sanction movement, it's all very impressive and very different from what it was when John made his film. But on the ground, uh, this machine of destruction, what one scholar called this geography of disaster, this geography of disaster, it's still the map of the day. It's still the, the cartography that is, is, is relevant to, to the life of every Palestinian child, woman, and man who lives between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean, and those who are still dwelling in refugee camps uh, all over the Middle East. And, and uh, we must think all the time what we can do more, because uh, this is unacceptable. This is really unacceptable, uh, this kind of suffering and this kind of colonization that still goes on in the 21st century. Yeah. 
Joe, I, can I just add in? Yes, John. What uh, Alana said is, you know, he, <clears throat> there's only a few who are members of, prominent members of the resistance of truth and fact. And that has been, apart from the, the suffering and the loss of lives amongst Palestinians, that has been the greatest casualty. We now have the charge of anti-Semitism uh, anti being used against anybody. We have the current Bennett, the current prime minister, is, is, occupies the same lunar political position as predecessor, but perhaps a few notches further out, I don't know. But now saying that Ben and Jerry's are <coughs> anti-Semitic and everything is anti-Semitic. Um, I used to uh, threaten uh, Jewish magazines that dared to suggest that my work was anti-Semitic and I would get an apology. <laughs> that's, a, that's all gone now because it is, if you like, it is mainstream within a media narrative. The narrative has shifted to such an extreme now that the gaps that used to exist within that narrative for the likes of myself and in academic circles for the likes of Ilan and others, uh, I would think has all but closed. Journalistically, it's certainly closed and even the technical problems you had at the beginning wouldn't be entirely unrelated, Joe. Uh, mm. it, it, it is, and your first question was that, why? Why are people left with this fog of ignorance, of truths that should be so clear and obvious? Why are we allowed to go down media rabbit holes and discuss certain imagined massacres, perhaps within China, and there's one in our own midst, as it were, and we're not even allowed to examine it within Palestine, in Palestine. Uh, yes, there is people like yourselves, consortium and so on, but as you know, the, the, the so-called misnamed mainstream does have the power and it oper operates such a propaganda role that has long standing, but is now more extreme than ever. It's infected all, uh, political discourse, the Labour Party in this country, the whole Corbyn affair uh, was, was almost jaw dropping uh, in, in the way uh, it was so obvious. The, the, the attack on, on a Labour leadership that, um, uh, and the, the use of anti-Semitism, it's almost as if it's become so powerful within the propaganda. I'm not saying amongst, I'm not saying amongst people who are thoughtful and think about, and the wonderful thing is to find, to find people who do have a view that isn't ignorant uh, and yet maybe have been exposed to the Guardian every day or the New York Times or something, but still their minds are free. The propaganda in our societies now is so extraordinary, uh, so insidious and so powerful that it, it, almost it, what happened with the propagating of Israel, the legend of Israel, all the myths of Israel, uh, right from the beginning, right through today, uh, the, the conversion of once good reporters, I won't, I don't think it's right I should even name people that I've written about who congratulated for their work, because now their work I wouldn't look at because they've gone through lobotomies almost. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a constant. Or the time when Bob Parrott 
was running consortium. Uh, even Bob, I think, popping back now would be shocked mm. to see how far it's extended. Now. It's only three years since we lost Bob. You mentioned the Labour Party, John. I'm curious, in your film, you, you make quick reference to Blair. Now, clearly, Washington, uh, without Washington's cover and at the UN, without its military assistance, without the political backing, without uh, all the other things, including states who are now uh, trying to prosecute people for boycotting Israel. Without that, uh, they wouldn't, Israel probably would not have been able to get away with what they've gotten away with. But Britain has played a role, too. And I wonder if you could tell us what happened. Because it seems like in the foreign office, there was a far more balanced view of the conflict in the 80s, uh, at least. And uh, but something happened where Britain became very much more officially, anyway, pro Palace pro Israel and to the point where we saw what happened to Corbyn happened, which I doubt could have happened in the 80s what do you, or even early. What do, you, what do you say about that? I'm not sure about that, Joe. I think that what's happened in this country is that um, uh, at around the time of uh, um, 48, the beginning of Israel and so on, there was still a large, and I would call them and they, they were an interesting group, but they were an Arabist group within, within the Foreign Office. Uh, they at least, although they, they're clear bias and was in a particularly, often particularly colonial way towards the Arab world, um, they did bring another view of it. And you must remember that even in the cross the Atlantic in the United States, the Eisenhower administration wasn't particularly uh, friendly to uh, Israel at the time of at the time of Suez in '56. Uh, the Americans really uh, didn't want to know. Um, there's been a big change since then. Uh, the Labour Party, for me, has always represented the barometer of that change. It's always had a solid Zionist component in it uh, and, uh, and a rather solid spooky Zionist component. There are a number of Labour MPs and peers who I knew who were freelancing for the, for the uh, intelligence services in Britain at the same time as sitting in, in Parliament uh, and were rapidly pro-Israel. Um, it was left to perhaps uh, a liberal, small L liberal rump of people to defend, quote, decency, and they disappeared pretty quickly. Uh, it's now dominated by a pro Israel, they like, they never use, rarely use the word Zionist. Um, uh, they, they, uh, they will nod towards Palestinian suffering at the time, but not really. Uh, and I didn't quite imagine when I made the film 20 years ago, that, that would be the case politically now. It's progressed to a far greater and ex extreme than I imagined. So Labour and Blair, in answer to your question, Joe, Blair accelerated that. He is, he is, uh, um, you, when you meet some of right-wing labor like him, they are passionately pro-Israel, pro-Zionist. For them, it's, it keeps the whole colonial show on the road. Israel is, is their man out in the Middle East. Um, it, it's, I, I, can't, I can't begin to analyze it, and I could do it much better than I, but it, it's, it's certainly, uh, he, he ran a Zionist administration and, and, and then was able, of course, being Blair to fit himself up as some kind of uh, uh, adjudicator and make a lot of money in the process. But uh, uh, it, 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 certainly, it certainly speeded up then and Corbyn was seen, of course, he, his threat was exaggerated. Jeremy Corbyn was a, a decent social democrat and social democrats had been virtually exterminated. Uh, 
and uh, but not really a threat uh, to anybody. I wouldn't have thought he was going to bring in some long overdue reforms and possibly do one or two things. He was going to recognise Palestine. Now that's that was quite a move, but uh, uh, all the alarm bells went with him and they got rid of him. It was a, absolutely, we can use any term we like, coup d'etat, they did a job on him. Uh, and Labour is today uh, a, a Zionist party, uh, completely in lockstep with, with Israel and, and with the Conservative government. I wanted to ask as well about some of the um, aspects of this issue that we don't often connect together that are you know not particularly what we see on the ground as what you document in your, in your film issues of um you know israeli blackmail as as relates to stories like the ones around jeffrey epstein um Ilan and john if you could just comment that on that briefly i'd appreciate it yes um, you could connect yes. those dots i appreciate it yes well we've had yes all those great ancillary scandals if you like well the Guardian has just um, uh, published over many pages the thing about the Pegasus project and in, as part of a consortium all over the world. Well, yeah, that's, that's okay, except that um, um, what it was very careful to do right throughout the coverage uh, was to give the impression that this company... Uh, uh, Israeli company, cyber warfare company, was separate from the Israeli state. It wasn't. In fact, the Defense, Defense Department, Defense Ministry in Israel has to license these companies. It can't be what it is. They're, they're part of it. Uh, so um, it didn't, it sort of run into the sand. That told us some interesting things about various people um, being uh, hacked and so on, but it should have reminded us of Israel's reach across the world and its historical reach. It's, it's reach into South Africa and the role it played in helping South Africa develop uh, nuclear weapons. It's reach into Central America and the part it played in keeping those vicious regimes during the Reagan period afloat. It's reach into Myanmar, where it's training of, of, uh, of the Burmese, a lot of the Burmese special units, uh, and into Iraq, the invasion of Iraq. Uh, Israel is the, is the go-to uh, manual for often for major in Western invasions. And Israeli soldiers are up there on the front line in Syria and in, in Iraq and elsewhere, all over the world. So um, that was, the Pegasus thing is part of that, but it should have, we should have understood a much wider, um, we should have had a much wider view of Israel, uh, this utterly unique in a colonial sense, imperial sense, state and its role in the world, which we didn't get. John, uh, I hope you can stick around a little longer. I have a question for Elon now. Um, we're talking about the last 20 years. There's been an extraordinary move, it seems, to the right. I, there was an expression that the Bush uh, senior had about the neocons, that there were crazies in the basement. And I recall talking to someone I, uh, 20 years ago who was referring to the idea of annexing settlements, um, of the idea now that police have actually gone up to the mosque, to Alaska, to the so-called Temple Mount, to enter the mosque when before it was only Sharon going up there, walking that created an intifada. And, uh, People talking maybe, as they did in John's film, but I want to ask you, is there more of a belief now that they could actually rebuild this temple? In other words, is this extreme right, these extreme right ideas that may have been suppressed before, are they more openly being expressed now? And how alarming is that? And the second part of that is what happened to the Israeli left to counter this? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know how far they will go with the... Um... 
uh, with the Temple Mount, uh, they went far enough, of course, this May. Uh, and uh, you're right to say that uh, kind of extreme fanatic right wing uh, uh, Jews who believe that Israel has the right to uh, bomb and blow up the, the, the mosque and build a third temple are not anymore in the margins. In fact, they can, and they were already and can be members of the future uh, government. Uh, they're still not the ones who are running the show, uh, but they're getting nearer to, to, to that uh, position and that's very frightening. Uh, but I think that uh, what is more important without uh, underrating the importance of the Al-Aqsa and the religious side of things, I think what is far more important is the fact that the movement to the right created uh, a clear strategic decision by the Israeli Jewish society. And this is not going to change. And that in a way also answers your second question. It, it took time for the Israeli Jewish society to realize uh, that they were at the juncture. And from that juncture, there were only two options. Uh, the liberal Zionists always hoped that there was a third option, but there was only two options. And, and this is what happened to people who believed in the two state solution and now realize that only the one state solution is possible. At the juncture, which happened somewhere at the beginning of this century, you could either become an apartheid state all over historical Palestine or a democratic state all over historical Palestine. There is no third option. The whole idea that uh, partitioning the land into two states would somehow resolve this contradiction between having a racist apartheid state on the one hand and a democratic state on the other went into this uh, into thin air. It's not working because of Zionist ideology. And if you get rid of Zionist ideology as the major ideological infrastructure of the future, you don't need a two state solution. You need one state uh, uh, for all. So they took the decision. If it's either being a democracy or being a racist apartheid state, they prefer the latter. This is now mainstream Israeli uh, uh, politics. This is not a right-wing, marginal right-wing positions. This is what we call now in Israel the center. Uh, so that uh, an Israeli electorate that goes to the next elections in many ways has, has two options, extreme right or center right. Center right believes uh, in the words of the late Itzhak Shamir that the status quo is working at, to your advantage. Actually, what's, what you have is not so bad, and incrementally, you can improve it. You can expel another village. You can slowly annex another part of Area C in the West Bank. You can add another uh, apartheid law that curbs the freedoms of the Palestinians inside Israel. But more and more, do you have the infrastructure to uh, uphold uh, the colonial rule over millions of Palestinians. And it gives a lot of jobs. Uh, uh, it keeps the army happy. The security service is happy, uh, and it seems that the world accepts it, and that's what is uh, important. So that's one option. The other option, which most Israeli Jews for now are not opting for, but they might, is no, we need to temper, if you want, with God's will. Uh, and we need to, to take drastic uh, uh, steps and uh, make it even clearer to the world that we, uh, the whole of Jerusalem belongs to the Jewish people, the whole of the West Bank belongs to the Jewish people, and that the Palestinians who are not willing to accept it should give and ex be expelled and so on. In, in that kind of atmosphere, the, if you are a member of the left inside the Israeli Jewish society, you cannot adopt anymore, as some people still try to, a liberal Zionist view. And that's what they're trying to do. And rightly so, the Israeli electorate are tired of this uh, game, mind game, of saying I'm a liberal Zionist. Being a liberal Zionist is like being an enlightened colonizer, like being a progressive ethnic cleanser, like being a civilized genocider. Uh, you, you, you can't, it, this is, it's an oxymoron. And people realize it, they realize it. Now, to be an anti-Zionist left inside Israel is something that a younger generation has been willing to adopt. It's very small. Uh, it doesn't have yet any impact on the Jewish society. And I think its ability to work from within depends very much 
on um, development outside of Israel and Palestine. For instance, uh, a more effective international pressure from the outside, a more clear united Palestinian vision for the future. If these two things would develop properly, I think you will see that this particular small group uh, who, you know, they belong to the place, they're a third generation here, there's no need for them to leave, but they can understand and understand uh, that there is a different way of living and a different way of treating another human being than the one that is being kind of paid for them through the ideology, their educational system, the service in the army, uh, and so on. So I think that unless there will be the pressure from the outside and the successful Palestinian struggle from within, there is no reason to expect any change from within the Israeli society. And without change, there's always the danger that you even uh, will, will have something worse and you might even long for Netanyahu and Bennett in the future. Uh, okay. So uh, we, 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 I think that it's upon us to, to insist that we, you know, films like John are not just asking for sympathy and empathy and solidarity. They do. But I think what they asked in 2002 is what we are asking today. We need your help in the world. It's urgent. The destruction is not over. The destruction has not stopped. We, ha we have seen the worst, but we haven't seen the worst of it as yet. Hmm. What is, uh, what this is, is the kind of urgency that, that we all feel when we, we go around. It's, it's not just making people acknowledge what goes on. We need their help to stop it. That's what Palestinians on the ground will tell you. Uh, do they realize that in any given moment, my house can be demolished, I can be ex expelled, I can be banished, uh, I can lose my job, I cannot go to the... Do, do they understand it? And this is done with the on, within the only democracy in the Middle East, uh, with the blue-eyed boy of the Western world. Uh, what, what are our chances of stopping it? not only rectifying the evils of the past, preventing those of the future uh, is something that we all should kind of do all we can, our utmost, uh, to try and stop. Uh, what is the worst, Ilan? Uh, we started talk at the beginning of the show talking about the C word, uh, uh, censorship. There's another one that I think is overused. That's the F word, fascism. And we've seen these mobs in May, uh, these on street mobs that supposedly surprised everybody. I don't know if that's true. The march of the flags that went ahead. Uh, we have the interior minister, Ayelet Shekhet saying things like, uh, they should, we should go to their homes where they raise their snakes and get rid of them because more little snakes will be raised. I mean, this type of, uh, I, I'm sure people thought that way in Israel years ago, but I wonder if you could tell me how many publicly say that now. I. I interviewed Hanan Ashrawi in her office in, in Ramallah. And uh, I asked her, and she around up, and she's pretty cautious, I think, said, yes, Israel is a fascist society. Uh, that's a very sensitive topic, given, of course, what happened with the Holocaust and in Nazi Germany. What is it a mistake to call Israel a fascist society? Do we need to use that mid-20th century term at all? Or is there another way to describe what's going on? No, I, I think we should. Uh, I would go further than that. I, I think that uh, uh, even myself in my, in my research, I was hesitant to use uh, the word institutional racism when it came to Israel. But Israel was actually, uh, you know, we used kind of uh, instinctively the term apartheid state. But we don't, sometimes we don't think uh, profoundly enough of what we mean by what we say, you know? You think about segregation laws and so on, but this is just, the veneer. This is not the most important thing about an apartheid state. What is important is that this is a chapter in the history of racism that produced slavery, uh, the genocide of Africans, and so on. Uh, there is always a fear among uh, uh, activists to say, but wait a minute, if you will talk about Israel as a racist society and a state, you're talking about the possibility that Jews can be racist as well after being victims to one of the most, one of the worst form of racism in the Second World War. And I think that's where we, we come back and say to people, abused uh, people can be abusers. 
victimize, victims can become victimizers. Uh, and uh, racism is uh, a very, or racialization, racialization of people is something which is inherent into a settler, is built into a settler colonial project like Zionism. So of course, it is, it's much more than just fascism in the sense that, you know, the state is above all and you kind of curb any democratic mechanism to stop the, 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 the people from doing what they want to do. I think the, 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 the model that South Africa had was far more uh, important here. In, in, in scholarly language, we used to call it the, the master's democracy which means that the, the masters themselves has a demo, have a democratic structure to decide between themselves what they want. But there's a whole nation that is ruled, colonized, oppressed by the, the, the heron folk, by the, master, by the master race. So yes, racism is at the heart of the treatment of Palestinians. And you cannot ethnically cleanse people in 1948. You cannot massacre the people of Gaza repeatedly since 2006 if you don't dehumanize them. And at the heart of every racism is dehumanization. We have to remember that. And I am a product, obviously a flawed product of the Israeli educational system. I don't think that they present me in the world as, uh, as a to, you know, showcase for, for the success of the Israeli educational system. But I went through this system. And a ra this is nothing new. From cradle to the grave, we are taught and indoctrinated to see the Arabs as subhumans, or as the, the, the scholar Paul Gilroy calls them, infrahuman. You know, as, as people who don't have the same uh, cultural uh, attributes that we have, they don't suffer as we do, uh, they don't deserve the same things that other human beings uh, deserve. You have to have this point of view because you come in the late 19th century and you believe that you have the moral right to displace the indigenous people and replace them. There's nothing new, by the way. They're, they're not exceptional. People did it in Australia. <laughs> people did it in North America. It's just when it comes to Zionism, when you say to them, you know, you're not the only people who, uh, uh, re, re, displaced and replaced indigenous people. But you are the only people I know who deny that you are doing it. You are the only people who are still doing it. And you are the only people who, who gets an immunity because of something horrible that was done to you in the Second World War. By the way, I don't think it's the only reason that Israel gets immunity. John, mm -hmm. John mentioned other explanations, which I fully uh, share why Israel gets immunity. And we have to remember, and with this I would end, Zionism started as a Christian project, not a Jewish project. It was an anti-Semitic evangelical project that saw a solution for the presence of the Jews in Europe by sending them to Palestine as a kind of a double bill, a double achievement for an evangelical Christian in the late 19th century. You get rid of the Jews, and you contribute to the end of time scenario that would precipitate the second coming of the Messiah, the resurrection of the dead, and the conversion of the Jews to Christianity or their barbecuing in hell if, if they should choose to make the wrong decision. The, the, there was a, a strong support among major British policymakers and German policymakers in the evangelical churches to this idea that the Jews should go back to Palestine in order to precipitate this uh, scenario. Also among the Americans, uh, politicians and writers, at the same time on the other side of the Atlantic, uh, you, you had this kind of support. I'm writing now a book which is called Lobbying for Zionism on both sides of the phone. And, and, and I, I go back to these 19th century. It's, it's quite incredible. Long before the, the Jewish activists thought that Palestine is a solution, for anti-Semitism, they were prodded, they were pressured by American and British uh, evangelical theologians to think in that way. And, and the motive was totally anti-Semitic. They wished to purify the Christian community from the presence of Jews. That's a very interesting. I just add. Yes, John. 
I want to. Uh, uh, one group missing from there. Uh, that uh, I mean, I I personally don't find it at all surprising that uh, another bunch of extremists, that is, evangelical Christians, are joining extremist Zionists doing something similar. Uh, nice Christian gentlemen went off during the 19th century and and did awful things uh, in the name of the British Empire. Uh, that's uh, um, that that brings their it, it back to something that is about control. Today in Australia, the indigenous people are still, in fact, frozen in a kind of uh, in a in a in a um, uh, a colonial situation an imperial situation, basically dispossessed and denied, but central to this, and this is what I was going to add, central to this, and not all, only these other groups, but is the collusion of people who regard themselves as right-thinking liberal people. And it's not just organized liberal people, but but that, that has been the great shift for me today, is that this, that uh, the broad liberalism that in fact has such an honorable name in so many ways uh, in this country and its origins of getting rid of slavery and so on. But now only, it now it draws the frontiers of how far you go. It draws those boundaries and it polices them. You see it in the media. I don't find the media, the, the right-wing media, particularly surprising. In fact, you can often find rather more truth in the right-wing media than you can in the so-called liberal media. But putting aside the media, that whole liberal thinking, which has just hasn't developed. It may have developed in terms of our relationships with each other in that we've learned to live in different configurations and to be more tolerant of us, even, even at times more tolerant uh, in terms of racism, certainly more tolerant in, the, in, in terms of social and the way we live our social and sexual lives. But it maintains, it maintains its commitment to its own view of superiority. And when you mentioned Blair earlier, I mean, Blair was the ultimate of that. Blair was a true liberal. He let his extremism show too much by invading a country and causing the deaths of a large number of people. But his liberalism uh, was, was uh, what, what gave him the attraction here. It appealed to a tradition. Uh, it, uh, it, it, it's the same as true of the Democratic Party of the United States, same as true of many other countries that perhaps if the term is still used, might still regard themselves as social democracies. They're not anymore. They've, they've become, they've moved into that area of of accepting this narrative of extremism, which is exemplified by the narrative of, of, of Zionism. So it's in a way, there's a it's it's that collusion uh, from the liberal world, not not simply from the the rest of the conservative world, uh, that in my view, is one of the reasons that Zionism keeps ticking over. It is an imperial project. Uh, and uh, Alain, do you, is there, when you mentioned rightly that it was a force from outside, it's only a force from outside that will begin to change this. I, I think broadly that's what you were saying. Is, is there, what, what, I mean, we've seen, I mean, apartheid South Africa was very different in many ways, but there was a moment, several moments in the 80s, uh, 
not least the liberalism wanting to get rid of this eyesore uh, as well. Uh, but it also had to do with the economy and that the Reagan administration was fed up with it and so on. Is there a, and I hate to use that cliche, but here it comes, is there a circuit breaker of some kind uh, that might begin to see change coming along? Well, it's a good question and not an easy one to answer. I, I think I would add also being kind of inspired by what happened in South Africa. I remember uh, Desmond Tutu telling me that um, once uh, the Berlin Wall fell and kind of the Cold War came to an end, Mandela was still on Robben Island and he sent one yep. of these notes saying the end of apartheid is near mm -hmm. and they thought that something happened to him. Uh, but he saw the connection between the inability of the right, the neocons in America to call apartheid as an important bastion against communism as easing the way for America to use, to, to, to join the sanctions. Absolutely. And he thought that once America joins the sanctions <laughs> regime, uh, many things would happen. I, I think that in, in the case of, um, of Israel and Palestine, uh, uh, although there are some positive changes in, uh, in the younger generation of the Democratic Party in the United States, as we have seen, uh, these processes are very slow. I mean, the processes by which the po clear positions in the civil society would translate to policies by the political elites in the West are going to take too much time to be the kind of, of breaking the kind of, or being this uh, performative, uh, transform transformative, factor that would change dramatically uh, the events. I, I, I see it somewhere else in, in two different places. Once, uh, one is uh, away from the West. I mean, the, the big question is, will um, countries which are not in the West uh, be more susceptible in the future, not immediately now? Countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, not surprisingly, Israel invests a lot now in these two countries. It, it's very worried that countries like this would form a different kind of international perspective on Palestine, uh, which will be, which will reflect very authentically and democratically what most people in Malaysia and Indonesia think about uh, Palestine. In a similar way in Africa and South Africa and Latin America. So I think that's one place to look at. Uh, a change kind of, uh, the move from Pax Americana, where America is, is the dominant role, uh, with internal processes in America maybe as well leading to an American withdrawal, uh, and, and a new kind of international intervention. That's one. The second one, uh, which I think is beginning, and, and, and relates a little bit to Elizabeth's uh, question about the, the, the kind of unforeseen, unseen networks that are connected to Israel and we expose them. There is now a, a networking between minority groups that understand, for instance, as in the case of African-Americans, that the securitization uh, uh, of Israel reaches the United States and that the security industry in Israel and its cap capabilities is behind some of the worst uh, police tactics in Ferguson uh, and, and in other parts of the United States. There's a similar recognition among the people who resist the, the, the way the Brazilian police uh, behaves in the, in, in, towards the, the, the black Brazilians uh, and in the poor areas of Brazil. What I'm trying to say here is that certain communities like the African-American community who were very, uh, reserved in their support uh, for Palestine, apart from known figures on, on the left in, in that community, are now beginning to see the connection between international corporations, uh, uh, Israeli uh, security services, and their own daily oppression. It becomes global. It, it's not localized anymore. And I think this is a powerful uh, uh, movement uh, still to to be seen if it has the power to, to change things. I mean, it's very powerful energy, but we're not sure if it's channeled correctly uh, and, and so on. Uh, we saw it in, in the Arab Spring where, where 
uh, definitely a very genuine uh, uh, energy for change was not channeled towards the right uh, direction. So, so there is a, uh, there is still this to 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 be considered. But I think that the, the fact that also the Palestinians themselves have recognized now that they need not just the old you know the old support of the Soviet Union is gone. Uh, the support of Arab regimes is, is doubtful. I mean, the, the regimes are worse than America when it comes to Palestine. So there is a new networking. There's a new uh, uh, network of identification uh, that they are now, I think, realizing with indigenous people, with oppressed minorities. And I feel that this is something that has a potential to, to make it far more significant as an intervention from, from the outside. And finally, I do think, and, and here I, I have to give the credit, if it's, if it's going to be true, I have to give, give uh, the credit to uh, Perry Anderson, uh, the late uh, Perry Anderson. He, he once said to me that I should watch for what happens to Saudi Arabia. If Saudi Arabia, the regime there, of course, not the country, but if the regime falls, there is a domino effect with, with the whole Western, and I think he's right in a way, with the whole Western concept of what is the Arab world, how should the Arab world be managed? And Israel is an important part in this perception. This whole perception is going to collapse. It's going to be kind of, you know, uh, toppled, toppled. Uh, if you want, uh, the, the Sykes-Picot agreement is going to come to an end. You know, the, the, the political order that the imperialist West has imposed on the Arab world is going to, uh, to collapse. This, any collapse is also a moment, a very dangerous moment. We know that. It's a moment of chaos. It's a moment of, of violence and so on. But it's also a moment, sometimes you need these moments if you really want to rebuild. And you cannot rebuild Israel and Palestine if you don't rebuild at least the Eastern Mediterranean or the Arabs call the Mashraq, the, the, the Eastern part of the Mediterranean. It also has to be rebuilt. Syria has to be rebuilt. Iraq is not natural. It has to be rebuilt. There's something there in Lebanon as well. We see it now in Lebanon. These are countries that are made of, of certain historical realities, certain cultural and social realities, which uh, political systems have to adapt and not force itself on them. And, and I think this is part of, of a new energy that I read in Arab, in young, among young Arab intellectuals in the area. It is not so much a romantic view on the Ottoman Empire, which respected communities and knew exactly what live and, live and, and let live meant, you know, kind of a genuine coexistence, not a false multicultural one, a genuine coexistence. It has to be, of course, a new version of this that is adapted to the 21st century. And there are new groups, not all groups are identified by, by religion and so on. Um, there's a beautiful book by my friend Osama Makdisi called The Ecumenical Frame that looks back into that period uh, between the, the, uh, the end of the empire, the Ottoman empire and between the wars where Arab intellectuals were beginning to understand that they want to build something on the basis of this kind of structure, where not all ideas come from the West, a lot of good ideas come from them themselves. And then Western imperialism said, no, no, no. We have the power to divide you to nation state and these nation states would be pitted one against the other because divide and rule is the name of the game. It's, a, it, it's very convincing and, and, and I think Palestine's future in short, and I'm, I'm finishing here, is not going to be resolved by itself. It is strongly and organically connected to the future of the area around it. It's the Israeli illusion. The Israelis really have an illusion that they're not part of this area. I don't know if you, if you realize it when you were here, uh, John and, and, and Joe. Uh, Israelis really believe that they are part of Europe, uh, 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 geographically. Um, and, and they don't realize that they are in the midst of an area that can either, it's like I always uh, compare it to a huge ship that is looking either for a safe harbor to anchor in, or the rough sea would continue to rattle it and make it impossible to live on it. And they are on that ship. 
even if they have the best cabin on that ship, they're still on that ship. It's, it's like, you know, even if you had the best cabin on the Titanic, you were still on the Titanic. It didn't matter if you were upgraded to the best cabin in the, in the ship. And, and, and this is what they don't realize. And I think this is something that is beyond their power. That's what I'm trying to say. It's beyond their power to change. Yeah. They don't have the power. They thought they had the power in Lebanon and see what happened to them. What, let, what happened, how they, they were thrown out of Lebanon with the tail in, in, inside their legs because they thought they had the power also to play with this political uh, structures yeah. around them. So now they're saying, well, well, it doesn't matter what happens there. You know, uh, Lebanon collapses, there's no, no impact on Israel. That ship had, uh, has Western Power written on the front and Western Power and the OECD in the 1970s had two thirds of uh, economic power in the world. It commanded, it now commands less than a third. Uh, that's one of numerous examples of the world we change. The world we don't see changing in, obviously in China, but we're only allowed to see it in a certain way, the road with uh, the enormous Eurasia, Russia, the world, and all the descriptions of it as multipolar and so on. I think illusions will last a very long time, as indeed the American uh, armaments industry will last a very long time. So power is, as it stands is here to stay. But those, those plates are shifting. And that, that, that ship called Western Power could be actually sailing into rough seas, uh, not in our lifetimes, but certainly coming up. And the idea of, of that, that Israel can only, that can effectively hold a ransom, a whole part of the world uh, indefinitely, uh, historically doesn't seem possible, but that's, uh, but that, that doesn't have anything apart from that it doesn't seem possible to say about it. <laughs> well, slightly optimistic tone here to end the program. I want to ask one more question, but if you can, a one word answer. John, in the year 2040, you go back to the region. Is Palestine still the issue? <laughs> right. Um, well, in, just on the basis of what I just suggested uh, 20 years uh, hmm. um, yes to a, a degree to a degree but not to the degree now I'm not a futurist Joe no. and I'm also uh, always worried about being drawn into it I used to uh, I've been asked about, uh, I reported apartheid South Africa for a number of years, and I used to be asked, you know, surely you'd see this coming to an end? Never, not in my lifetime. Well, it hasn't come to an end in effect, but it did in terms of uh, the, the, the old racist or the structural apartheid, yes, it did. Uh, I didn't forecast that. So well, that's just to say I'm a lousy, I'm a lousy soothsayer. Well, we won't, um, hold, we won't hold you I to don't, it. I don't know, Joe. I'm going, I'm going for the easy one there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, you know, what about you now? Uh, we're going to keep our eyes on uh, Riyadh and the Saudi royal family, because if they go, which is maybe one reason why they propped them up so much, um, what do you think 20 years from now? Is Palestine still the issue? Yeah, In the way, John. Going. As John said, it's, it's, it's very difficult uh, to, to predict. I'm, I'm sorry to be more kind of pragmatic on these questions where I say uh, we cannot take a teleological view, a determinist view and said uh, what happened in 2040 has nothing to do with us. It has a lot to do with us. Um, us, I don't mean just the six yeah. of us. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I mean the world and uh, uh, I, I always uh, kind of tell the younger generation that they sometimes come to, to look me up at the University of Exeter 
Some of them are desperate. They said, you know, been active for two years and we don't see the dividends. Nothing is, is changing. And I would say to them, you know, look at, uh, don't look and ask yourself, what have you achieved? But just ask yourself, have you done enough yesterday? That, that's the only question you cannot really predict the accumulative uh, impact your own ac activism would have on this. Um, but you, 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 you at least need to be at peace with yourself on, on that. So therefore, I, I'm, I'm a, an optimist but, but, but by nature and, and uh, I, I've seen things that I like to, to kind of adhere to them but remain realistic to understand that they are not the future yet. For example, it's impossible for an Amer Israeli diplomat to enter American campuses today without, uh, you know, even when uh, the Israeli ambassador came to our university, they had to keep the place where he talks in, in, in secret. So they hardly had any, any audience because nobody knew where he was talking. Even we, the ones to protest, didn't know where he was talking because they, <laughs> they kept it. If you told me at the time of John's film that the campuses would be a no-go zone for, for Israeli official spokesperson, I would ask you, what have you taken? What kind of a pill have you taken? Um, so, I, I, or democratic members of the house, of, of members of the house speaking the way they do, even there are only three or five of them. Uh, and even with the failure of Jeremy Corbyn to have someone who is a candidate for the leadership. So you, you need to look at all these things and say, these are the achievements that are not enough by, by any stretch of the imagination. And some of them were achievements that did not fulfill, uh, did not last. But I think that's what you should look at, at, at the things that were working, even if only half work. Uh, so uh, there are two scenarios for 2040, either, either people with a modicum of consciousness in them, would be able to make this world different and with it, Palestine would be different. Or we would have webinars like this saying uh, 20 years from now, it's more or less the same. Uh, uh, but I don't leave it to fate. And I never say to my students, you know, this is something you have to live with, you know, take it and make it part, you know, as I say, like Corona, take, it would be part of your life now. No, it should not be part of your life and do what you can to, to, to change it. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sounding a bit messianic here, but uh, <laughs> I, I think it's important for the Palestinians, the people who work on their behalf should never lose faith and hope that they can change it. Because otherwise they don't need us for just you know simple solidarity or echoing their suffering. They need us as people who have the power to help them change the reality in which they live. Uh, and the truth, as John said, I mean, yes, the truth is a victim in the case of Palestine, but because it is the victim, it is very hard to, to deny it, even if you have 250 nuclear uh, uh, bombs, even if you have the strongest army in the region, and even if you have this network of coalition with you, it does, it's not enough to protect the truth. That's why they have to call John an anti-Semite. Otherwise, why call him an anti-Semite? They have to call John an anti-Semite because none of the powerful capacities is working to silence moral voices on Israel. And they're really uh, uh, irritated by this. They cannot send an F-16 to bomb his house in order to silence him. So they're weaponizing anti-Semitism. Uh, uh, you have to think about the means that they're using uh, because they don't want to build the state only on the material pillar. They want a moral pillar, and they don't have now a moral pillar for their project. They have the most they moral the army. Moral. What? They have the, the most, most moral pillar. army in the world. Yeah, if the army, if, if, one, if one's army uh, remains your moral pillar, you are in uh, trouble. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, that was uh, Israeli historian Elan Papi. We really thank you, Elan, for coming on the show. And he was talking with John Pilger, and we were discussing John's film of 20 years ago. Palestine is still the issue, and it certainly was on this program. So for Elizabeth Vos, my co-host, and Kathy Vogan, our executive producer, I want to thank everybody for watching. Thank our guests again, and we'll see you next time on CN Live. 
out your notebook. If you are a consumer of independent news, then the first place you should be going to is Consortium News. And please do try to support them when you can. It doesn't have its articles behind a paywall. It's free for everyone. It's one of the best news sites out there. And it's been in the business of independent journalism and adversarial independent journalism for over two decades. I hope that with the public's continuing support of Consortium News, it will continue for a very long time to come. Thank you so much.